the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray, and always ready to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour down on us the abundance of your mercy. 
Forgive us those things of which our conscience is afraid. And give us those good things for which we're not worthy to ask, except by the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading today is from Genesis 4, 1 through 15. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer of the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading today is from 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, 16 through 18. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. In my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. This morning, the Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 18th chapter. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. The tax collector, standing off, far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, 
a sinner. And I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, like a child, shall not enter it. This is the gospel of the Lord. We confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Grace and peace in the name of Jesus, in whose name we can be confident and sure. Amen. First of all, I'll say congratulations to those of you who um, are on Social Security benefits and receiving some payout. I just heard this week that you are about to get a, is it an 8.7% increase starting in January. This is really, really good news. For those of you who are much younger, can you be so sure about Social Security? Uh Uh-huh. I see you shaking your heads already. I want to give you some things today that you can be sure about. And I want to credit the uh, outline in your that's in your bulletin, partially from a friend in our partners in Ontario, Canada, Pastor Aaron Astley, who challenges us about what we can be sure. 
in the midst of exploding national debt and inflation. Do I have to read through this list? A predicted food shortage. Threats of global nuclear war. We thought that was gone in the 70s or 60s, didn't we? And they're talking about it, unfortunately, again. The demise of the social security system, the destruction of the nuclear family. Do you realize that? What's happened to the family in the last 50 years? Then compounded by a distrust of people in positions of authority. Statistics just aren't good for anyone who is in a position of authority. Not just lawyers or tele-evangelists. But Paul, in this text, if you look at it with me in 2 Timothy 4, talks like he's so confident, so sure. And in a world of uncertainty, here is where we need it the most. In verse 6, he says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Part I'm going to focus on most is down a little further. In verse 18 of the same text, He says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Paul speaks so confidently. And in a society, in a world where things are moving so quickly and changing so amazingly fast, Here is where we can turn. You realize Paul, here speaking, is likely giving us his last words, giving Timothy his last words. Paul in prison and says, the time has come for me to depart. His his life is going to end, and seemingly very, very soon. But he claims that the righteous judge Jesus will award him a crown, as I mentioned to the kids, a crown of righteousness. Paul speaks of this great promise, and I'm so thankful that he can have such confidence. Can I invite you to look at where he might have gotten that? Why is it that he can do that when, I'll tell you frankly, it was just a few years ago, one of the kids baptized and confirmed here in this church and was headed off, graduating from high school, expressed to me their concern that they weren't sure if God loved them, if their sins were forgiven, if they were really a Christian, if they're really going to heaven. I have to tell you, as a pastor, my my heart fell. I I felt crushed. Have Have I completely blown it? And all my talking and talking... Have you not heard this most important point of what we can and should be sure about? First of all, can I ask, was Paul's certainty based on his conversion experience? Have you heard folks talk about it? When I was young, when I went to Bible camp, I had this great feeling. I said yes to Jesus. I went forward or I got baptized or made some expression of my faith. And now I really got it. I'm certain. Is it based on your experience of conversion? If so, Paul certainly could have counted on his own. Remember how he was riding on the horse and how a light had hidden him, light hit him, and he saw this vision or presence of Christ himself and speaking to him directly. Wow, I've never experienced something like that. We think maybe this made Paul so sure now that God was going to do all that he promised. But there's a problem with that. Have you heard Christians talk about their experiences this way? Even though his, Paul's, was remarkable, yet there are very many other negative experiences in his life that could have robbed him of the certainty that he felt when he was knocked off his horse with this blinding light. 
So in 2 Corinthians 1, he describes the suffering he went through, as well as his companions in Asia. Paul was beaten at times. And in fact, when he says, I'm, I'm being poured out, it's possible, to take this quite literally, that, that his blood, after the beatings, left for dead and whipped and flogged. He could have been talking about his very own blood being poured out of his physical body. Likely, however, he's talking about everything that's a part of him, not just his physical blood. So all these experiences really can't direct him to say, now I'm sure because things have gone so well. Or was Paul's certainty based on his success as an apostle? You know, he was commissioned by the Lord at that conversion experience and led to go and preach to the Gentiles. And Paul wrote a large, if most, portion, if not most, of our New Testament. That speaks to how God used him and worked through him. He preached far and wide, so much more that at the end he said, I have fully preached through all the world. That's quite a statement. Is this what made him sure? Many try to find certainty in what they have done or accomplished. But you can probably hear where I'm going, that this can come up empty as well. Paul preached, do you remember this, in Athens, in Acts 17, in the great Areopagus with all the wise and great leaders of the area, perhaps of the world. The problem is we have epistles to Ephesus and Colossae and other parts, Galatians, and that whole region. We don't have any epistles to the church at Athens. We have nothing. Sometimes Paul was beaten and thrown out of town. And some days it feels like that for us as Christians, doesn't it? When your friends or co-workers and others think you're crazy for spending your Sunday morning here instead of somewhere else. No, you, you can't trust kind of your success either. Your certainty can't come from just that. In fact, I remember in Philippians, Paul says, all my Merits or accomplishments, I think, or others think that I have before God. He says, I consider them a pile of rubbish. No, they don't get you favor. They're not going to earn your way. In verse 17, I love that he's finally going to, you know where this is going. He's going to give all of his, quote, success credit to Christ. Or, was Paul's certainty based on the Lord's past care and provision for Paul? He was rescued from the mouth of a lion, which could be literal, or could also be a great picture of how God does take care of us, not only physically, but even more so, spirit and soul. Paul's certainty Certainty here seems to stretch well beyond just physical provision. What about, finally, Paul's faith? Another possibility is verses 6 through 8, and listen to all the eyes, kind of like Paul has done this himself. He says, I have fought the good fight. I could emphasize the I part. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. It kind of sounds as if Paul's own faith is the source of his certainty. But what does he mean by this? You know, many people try to find certainty by trusting in their own faith. You got to think about your language when you say this. Do you trust in your faith? Do you trust in your faith? Or maybe I should ask it this way. When I talk to folks who haven't 
I haven't seen in church in not only months, but sometimes over a year or more. Pastor, don't worry. My faith is strong. Then I start to get worried. When I say my faith is strong, as if we're putting our trust in our ability to believe or our part in doing something for our faith. It kind of sounds when people say that, don't worry, my faith is strong. It kind of sounds like they're trusting in their own ability to believe. The problem with this is that, you know, your own contribution or part of this is never complete. What if our faith wavers? What if we doubt? How do we know if we have believed enough? Is your faith great? Paul's own faith, his own ability to believe and keep the faith was not his source of certainty. But of course, we're getting closer when we talk about faith. Ultimately, Paul's certainty was not in his ability to believe, but in the one in whom Christian faith rests, that he is the one. Oh, do you remember this? I'll bring it up again. You've heard me quote this. If you go back to your old catechism, third article, how do we know? I Can you fill in the blanks? I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength. Dr. Luther wrote, he's right on target. He's on point. I cannot by my own strength believe in God or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with the gifts, sanctified and kept me in the one true faith. So the apostle Paul really here, and he says it throughout scriptures. He says it in Galatians 6, 14, far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. His faith is in Christ who was crucified. Even faith, since we had it just recently in Luke, the size of a mustard seed, that's a little bitty faith. But if it's faith in the one who was raised from the dead, the one that the world and Satan himself could not hold down, it's faith in what God has done in Christ in what he has done for you and in you. Trust in him. And so on Reformation Month, the end of October is going to be a Reformation celebration. Oh, that's coming up in just a week, isn't it? It's in Christ, in Christ alone. No part of mine can can I add to anything that's been done for my forgiveness, for this crown of righteousness. Even though you might hear hints of God's work through all of these other possibilities of, for certainty. So, I mean, Paul's conversion experience had meaning and could provide certainty, but only because Paul had been baptized into Christ and Christ crucified for him. Or his apostolic work, where many had come to faith and churches were planted. But Paul doesn't give credit to himself, and success can never be on worldly standards. It's what's done in faith in Christ that counts, and it's not done in vain. Or his memories of how the Lord provided for him, perhaps it was a literal mouth of a lion from which he was rescued. And if so, or the ways that God has provided for you through sickness in times of difficulty. You can give thanks that God's promises are true. He'll give you everything you need in this life and even more so in life eternal. No, Paul's faith did matter, and it mattered because it was in Christ. How can you, Paul, be so sure? How can you be sure? Because he knew Christ crucified crucified for the world, crucified for everyone who's ever lived. That would include your Old Testament reading, Cain. Cain, who, whose anger, we talked about in Bible Club on Thursday this week, last week. Cain, whose anger got the best of him. 
Cain, who was outraged, maybe depressed, and he acted out by striking and even sounds premeditated and ended up killing his brother. You would think God would certainly get rid of this one, murderers. No, God put a mark on him to protect him. Makes you wonder what that mark was, doesn't it? We don't know. But God was concerned about Cain. And God is concerned about everyone else. Even murderers like Paul. You remember before he was converted? He was persecuting and killing Christians. Paul's a murderer too. Look up Moses, David. The Bible's full of them. No, God has mercy on Cain. And he did. And he did for people like me and you too. Jesus Christ and him crucified is your certainty in life, in death, and in every other situation. You can be sure. You should be sure because of him. Thanks be to God for his resurrection, for his crown given to you, Christ crucified. In his name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace.